would like to say a big shout out to our um, webmaster and our tech people. I mean, how great is it that on a winter night like this that we can get together and talk about mushrooms? And so um, our talk is common mushroom knowledge for uncommon folks. That's us. Those people who like to get out there in the woods, go for a walk, go on a foray, and look for mushrooms. Okay. We're Claudette and John Lamprecht, as Peter mentioned. Um, we've been in the club since 2007. Um, many of you probably, I saw a lot of names on the list there tonight of people who we've been out um, on forays with. Um, I think of the um, seven forays that we did this summer, um, I see Aaron Berg and a few other people. Um, I don't have your names up right now, but Amelia, um, who were on forays with us this summer. And one of the things that, that, that hit us was that we have so many new people who are entering the club and who just don't have that basic 101 knowledge of, of mushrooms. And so our thought was tonight was to start um, many of our new people out with that information. So some of you, like I see Jean and Jennifer and you guys, um, you know, you know a lot of this, but, you know, feel free at the end to um, chime in on chat or whatever and um, share some of your knowledge as well. Okay. Here we go. All right. So, you know, why we picked the uh, title that we picked is because uh, you are unique people. Um, there's a lot of folks that... Um, are fully aware of morels, and that's about it. When you say you're a mushroom hunter, you say, oh yeah, we used to hunt morels too. And they think that that's the end of it. So what we're trying to do is fill in a lot of the information um, that we've come to uh, acquire over our time. Um, I'm new to mushrooming, relatively. I married into it um, because my, I was raised to be terrified of mushrooms. So much of my mushroom knowledge has been gained um, in particular by being in the mycological society um, and also being in that family who hunted mushrooms in Northeast Iowa. Um, and it was a, you know, it, it was very interesting. And what we have gained in knowledge since then is unbelievable. So we're going to try to fill in a lot of the gaps. There's many things that we took for granted that we thought we knew or we didn't even think about. So much of what we're going to say is not going to be earth shattering. It's going to be just like, well, I guess I kind of knew that, but I never really thought about it. So um, that's where a lot of our information tonight is going to be. Um, there's going to be some statistics and it's going to be boring because of that, but there will also be a lot of pictures. So we're going to move on here. Um, one of the realities, um, first of all, fungi have only been a kingdom in and of themselves um, since 1969. And it's estimated that there's one and a half million fungi in the world. As far as kingdoms go, there is only one group of living organisms that is larger than the kingdom of fungi, and that's the insects. So there's more insects than there is fungi, um, but um, fungi are extremely, extremely uh, well representative in our world. We have no idea actually how many there really are. It's estimated right now 150 million. It's probably two or three times that. And as far as that goes, it includes, well, it includes mushrooms, molds, yeast, rust, and a bunch of other things. In fact, the degree at, in the uh, University of Minnesota is usually associated with the plant pathology area because that's the primary concern of what fungi is for the impact that it has on our crops. But as far as mushrooms go, they're a fairly small number of that one and a half million fungi, like maybe 10%. Um, but the numbers are always changing. Um, there's probably been 100 to 150,000 who have been, or that have been identified. About a third of those are specifically mushrooms. So there's only about 50,000 mushrooms that have been identified. Of them, 10,000 or so are found in North America. 5,000 or so of those are found in, in Minnesota. Um, and if I have another statistic down here, I can't see it because my little bar is in the way. 
But um, so anyhow, and, and um, the other the other part of that is as far as in the documentation at the Bell Museum, there's only a couple of thousand that have actually been documented. So we've been working with them as well to try to um, enhance that information. Okay, so keeping going. Ah, my, this is going to be annoying if I can't figure out how to. Yeah, I can. All right. This is not an exact science by any means, but let me see. Um, okay. I'm trying to get this so that it's full screen and then I won't. Um, I won't be seeing my actually annoying little bar at the bottom that's um, at the bottom, but I can do that. Okay, so what is a mushroom to start with? First of all, a mushroom is, is just part of a fungus that um, it's not plant or animal. They have their own kingdom. And we're going to get a little bit further as we get down here. A fungus is like a plant, but it has no green leaves or chlorophyll, so it can't make its own food. Um, part of the reason why they actually removed it from the plant kingdom, because basically somebody in 1969 realized that, hey, fungus are not plants and they are not. So they had their own kingdom since 1969. And in, in, uh, in particular, the things that we spend all of our time looking when we're out in the woods, the mushroom is only the fruiting body of a spore bearing or the spore bearing body of a much larger fungal organism, similar to the apple on an apple tree. And the apple tree is out of sight, out of mind in the root system or in the bark, in the wood, uh, buried in the substrate, and actually can be really, really a large, um, a large organism by itself. The, uh, the other reality is that all kinds of mushrooms begin their life as a tiny spore. Um, and the spores actually take on all kinds of different shapes. There'll be much, there'll be a little bit more about spores as we get on in the presentation, because actually when you're doing an identification, the spore deposit can be one of, in fact, is one of the more important identification features. So learning how to do a spore print is an important thing. Now, how do mushrooms grow? Okay, so they start out as these spores. And the right kind of spores meet up with each other. They start growing underground as this fungal net, um, as this group of um, mycelium or threads underneath the ground. And eventually they pop up with mushrooms or this fruit body up above ground. Some of them are not above ground. Some of them are like the truffles or actually tubers that grow underground. Um, and there's a number of mushrooms that actually only fruit on, on very few occasions. And many of the mushrooms actually have extremely, extremely small windows of opportunity to actually see their fruit bodies. Um, that the fruit body actually may only be around for a matter of hours or days or it could be longer. So um, the other thing is that ripe mushrooms, once they ripen um, and actually start extreme, er, um, extending their cycle, as they get larger and older at the edge of the mycelial net, oftentimes you will see something that looks like this fairy ring on the far right hand side of the picture. Um, So let's see, moving on. And this is, this is a, a close-up of what the soil threads look like. This is actually, it, it, it's very difficult to actually try to identify a mushroom from the mycelia thread because within every spade of soil, there will be dozens of different types of mycelium growing in the ground. Much of what we always thought maybe were like little rootlets from plants and things like that are actually mycelial threads. So, um, but that is the reality. 
as I mentioned, and it's often part of the botany department that they that they get studied. However, again, plants have cellulose and they make their own food. There's a few exceptions, but um, by and large, that is true. Mushrooms, on the other hand, and fungus in general, but mushrooms specifically, because that's what we tend to uh, focus in on. They actually are made up of chitin and not cellulose. Chitin is is an exo, um, is the same stuff that's in the exoskeleton of arthropods. And mushrooms cannot make their own food. The mycelium is the um, actual body that does uh, the food intake. The mushrooms actually, again, all they do is they carry the spores, therefore continuing on the propagation. Here's some of the geekism here of the kingdom is fungi. The subkingdom for mushrooms is actually dicaria. And they break down into two different phylums. One is Ascomycota, and you can see those are called the sac fungi. And you can see some of the mushrooms that are actually within that, the morels, the truffles, cup fungi, and a couple of other things, and, and a lot of the lichen symbionts. And then there's the Basidiomycota, which are most of the guild mushrooms and the bolites and the polypores and uh, many of the other mushrooms that we're most familiar with. The hey, actual, John. Yes. Um, there's a question in the chat. Uh, yes. Richard Burton wants to know what is meant by making its own food. Making its own food, chlorophyll. Chlorophyll for plants. So plants are able to make their own food through, through chlorophyll. Mushrooms have to... Mushrooms have to actually get it from another source. They have to steal it. That's what I meant. Okay. Thanks for sharing that. Okay. So anyhow, um, the Ascomycota are actually, um, there are more numerically uh, than them, but many of them tend to be smaller and, and less obvious to us than many of the Basidiomycota, which are, uh, again, the more, common guild mushrooms and bolites and, and polypores that we see. Okay, let's see. How come it locked up and doesn't want to move? There we go. All right, so mushrooms actually get their, get their nutrition three different ways. And the, the biggest way that most people are probably familiar with is that some of these saprobes or decomposers. We've all heard um, it explained that fungi are nature's decomposers. In fact, um, it is true that if it was not for fungi on, in the breaking down of the uh, nutrients of dead organic matter, if, if, if it wasn't for them being able to recycle that organic, uh, those organic um, compounds back into the environment, we would be totally buried in dead organic matter or detritus or whatever it is. Um, so they do a gigantic job, but that's only one of the ways that, that um, mushrooms get their, uh, at least mushrooms can be classified in getting their nutrition. Some are actually parasites and actually harm the host and kill the host. Uh, some of our favorite, um, actually my favorite mushroom is the maitake or the giant hen of the woods mushroom is actually a parasite on the oak trees. And it will it causes a root rot and will eventually kill the kill the host tree um, unless the tree is particularly strong and can fight off the uh, parasite. Um, but that isn't normally what happens. So there's a number of those that that you see. It's not a, the largest group by any means. But then there's also some mushrooms that actually start out as parasites and then become become decomposers later on after they've killed it. Then they take further further advantage of it by breaking down the dead organic matter. And then there's also some symbiotic mushrooms and many of our more popular edible mushrooms such as the chanterelle and the porcini mushroom are actually symbionts. And some of the more familiar mushrooms like the Santa Claus mushroom or the, that, that red one with the white speckles on top, you'll see a picture here shortly. Um, that's actually a symbiotic mushroom. So it actually has a mutual relationship with with a plant host, uh, it benefits the host, it benefits the fungal organism. In fact, in the case of like our beloved orchids, 
our lady slippers. Um, if it wasn't for the fact that um, they have a, um, a mycorrhizal host or a, or a, a fungal host or a fungal uh, partner, um, they would not thrive. Uh, so orchids really rely on that relationship. In fact, um, it's estimated that some 90% of all plants um, require that kind of a relationship with some kind of a, a symbiotic uh, mycorrhizal fungi. Hi, John. Can I interrupt yeah. you again with yeah. two more questions from the yes. chat? Yeah. Uh, one person wants to know um, what is mycorrhiz mycorrhizae? Mycorrhizae, and then, yeah. And then a second person wants an example of a parasite that turns into a decomposer. Okay. Okay. I will, I will come up with both of those. All right. So first Thanks. of all, the mycorrhizae is um, a mycorrhizae is a symbiotic relationship between uh, the root systems and the, my, uh, the mycelial threads. So the plants have their, uh, there's both ecto and endomycorrhizae. That's getting a little bit more technical, but anyhow, what happens is, is the threads of the mycelium will actually move around the, uh, the outside of the, of the rootlets and all the root mechanisms of the plant and be um, useful in, usually one of the primary um, mechanisms that they do is they actually improve the, um, the efficiency with which micronutrients and water can be drawn up into the root system for that tree. So it's actually a, a very, very healthy thing for uh, oak trees in particular when, it's, when there's a very healthy uh, mycelial um, community with its with chanterelles or porcini or whatever. Um, so that's that. And a parasite in particular, it turns into a decomposer. Um, we think in particular, one of the more familiar mushrooms that we find in the fall here is called the honey mushroom. And the honey mushroom by and large is actually a parasite. It will kill the host in a lot of cases. And then it sort of turns into this at, at least some of its close, um, closely related um, other uh, genus or other species of those honey mushrooms will actually turn into decomposers of those um, trees that fall over and the trees that it kills. So that's, those are a couple of the examples. Um, so what ends up happening is the, um, you know, I talked about the one way that um, the mycorrhizal relationship is so good. So it's good for the, it's good for the uh, tree, but what the, um, what the mycorrhizal or the symbiotic partner with the tree gets is the sugars that come from the root systems. So it shares, the root system shares the sugars with the mycelial threads, and that's what actually feeds that mycelium or that organism. Whereas that uh, the mycelium for sap probes and parasites, um, that actually um, is being drawn directly from the um, from the host, and actually where it's harming or or breaking down and decomposing. So that's how the mechanism generally works in a very oversimplified way. But answering the question of edibility, because inevitably, I mean, there's a number of, I, first of all, I really wanted to welcome how many new people there are here because um, you know, our, our club has ex expanded greatly. Um, our memberships ex exploded. Um, and um, a number of our people have not had a chance to actually go out on forays, but inevitably when you go on a foray, in fact, the original reason why we probably joined the club is we had this burning question is, you know, I see it. Uh, I know it's a mushroom. I wonder if I can eat it. So that's the question. Is it edible? Well, okay. So answering the question of edibility in general sense, 50% are inedible. Totally. You just couldn't. 25% would be kind of edible, but they're so, it's, it's so icky to even think about it. 
there's 20% or so that will make you sick. They won't, they will kill you. They won't harm you likely anyhow, probably not harm you in the long term. And that there's only about 4% or so that's like one out of 25 that are good to eat and worthy of seeking or looking for. And then there's that 1% or less that will actually kill you. And I want to talk about that really, really quickly because any of the representations that you've seen on TV where somebody's fed this poisonous mushroom and they take a bite or two and then pretty soon they keel over in their soup. Um, that's not how mushroom toxins tend to work. They're much more slow action, acting than that. And every bit is dangerous, but they're much more slow acting. So, um, in fact, you know, they can be extremely, extremely punitive and nasty. Uh, but luckily, the numbers are really, really small, only about it's somewhat less than 1%. And here in Minnesota, there's only a, a small handful, probably three or four that are uh, really deadly that we would run into at any, any particular time. But again, 4%, one out of 25. So the odds aren't really in your favor about that edibility question. But we up here in Minnesota actually tend to be a little bit more fortunate than that. As we know, mushrooms can be used for a lot of different things, bread, beer, medicines. In fact, I think a lot of people are interested in mushrooms for a variety of different medication type of things that are coming up. Um, there's been a lot of research done with the turkey tail for breast cancer and prostate cancer. Um, we have a lot of people in our club who are interested in using mushrooms for dyeing wool and fabrics, bricks, fake leather, cheese, and much more. Okay, let's take a look at some of these mushrooms. And I'm sure most of you have seen these in pictures. We don't have many red ones here, but we were fortunate enough to see uh, um, these in Colorado this past summer. Okay, Amanitas. Let's take a look at a few more mushrooms. Just to get our eyes squared away. Yes, we can see some of these here in Minnesota. So this is a, an Amanita that we have here in Minnesota. This is the, the one we tend to have here is the yellow version of the red one. Yeah. Here. So they look very similar because they they really are, but we have the yellow, yellow version. Oh, and it's fun to go out and find a good number of edibles. This happens to be myself. And then we were out and these were all at the same tree. We picked over 60 pounds of hen of the wood, my taffy, at one particular oak tree. And that oak tree provided us with mushrooms for up to, I think, eight years and is now gone. It's Shucks. fallen over. It's, it's fallen fallen right, over. over. <laughs> Back, right over her, her left shoulder. That, that was the tree. Yep. Yep. Um, we like to have families start, our family started very young. Um, I started at three with my grandmother going out and we started our boys and our nieces out into the woods. Um, we would often go and visit my mom. And as you can see, there's a variety of mushrooms here. The kids are holding giant puff balls. And in the back of the car there, there's honey mushrooms and hen of the woods. Wasn't it great this past summer that we were so blessed with those rains at the right time of the year, just before the state fair, to see so many large puffballs? I think we had gone three years without seeing them, and all of a sudden, with those rains, they're back. It was super. And of course, our state mushroom, and the one that we all want to look at in the spring, our morel. There really is a variety of, this is a, um, a honey fungus that has caused um, an, a, a, what we call a, been attacked, attacked right? by yeah. another um, antiloma fungus, um, mushroom, and has produced um, what we call stump dumplings. Our lobster fungus. Which is actually a combination of a couple of different fungus, one fungus that attacks another fungus again. So mushrooms are, <coughs> are really all over the place. I mean, they, they've, they're very, very old organisms. Um, and 
in terms of area, actually a honey fungus that I talked about once before, or, uh, before as being a parasite and a decomposer. Uh, one of the ones in particular in Oregon is believed to be the largest organism on earth, covering 2,200 acres and an estimate of 2,400 years old. Uh, the mycelium from all corners of that 2,200 acres is exactly the same DNA, um, believed to be the same thing. Uh, you may have heard the term the humongous fungus. That's in the upper peninsula of Michigan, where they have a similar sized one. And I think that they go back and forth to try and do, uh, say who's got the biggest one. Um, the bad news is actually that this particular mushroom can be seen from the air because of the, the detrimental effect it has on the forest, uh, the 2,200 acres um, that it, uh, it is encompassing. So it's the mycelium underground that is actually the bulk of the organism, not just all the fruit bodies that pop up because of it. Again, we see only the fruit body, the spore bearing surface and the spores are in, you know, I mean, for lack of a better term, they're basically the seeds of the fungus and the mycelium is the main mass of the fungus and the hyphae are the tiniest little threads um, that form that mycelium. And actually the, um, it's, it's believed that the, um, the teeny little fungal elements are actually somewhat, uh, those mice, those uh, hyphae are actually 10 times thinner than a human hair, um, the individual ones. And then when they bunch of them get together, it's a mycelium, it's a, a bigger mat and actually much, much larger and easier to see with our naked eye. Um, rhizomorphs are actually a root-like mycelium, uh, a darkened structure that actually helps that mycelium uh, take up even more water to feed, its, um, to feed itself. Um, and it's the honey mushrooms in particular that, that feature this, but there's a few other species that do. And there are at least 60 species of mushrooms that exhibit bioluminescence. So we're gonna show a couple of pictures of some mushrooms here uh, based on those facts. This is what a close-up of some honey mushrooms look like. Now, they don't taste like honey. That's not where they get their name. It's because the honey mushrooms in general um, run, the, run the range of about the same colors that honey would run. Um, they also can be a little bit sort of gooey or that's not a scientific term, I know, but, um, but have that sort of, you know, sticky gooiness to them um, on the outside on occasion, depending on how you cook them um, and how you prepare them. Or if you handle them, you'll notice sort of a stickiness that gets under your finger. Um, and um, that's another reason why they get the name honey fungus. And there's some of the rhizomorphs that come from, you may see that underneath the bark of a lot of trees. Um, it's called bootlace, uh, kind of like a bootlace. Um, Fungus uh, would be one of the nicknames sometimes for honey mushrooms. Fall buttons is another nickname. Um, not an easy mushroom to identify. And this is one of the, uh, this is called the jack-o'-lantern mushroom. And this is one of the uh, bioluminescent ones. Now you're not gonna see, you know, if I shut off the lights and we, or we found this in the dark, it wouldn't be sitting there glowing underneath the bot, um, underneath this park bench that it was growing under. Um, but, the small individual caps, especially the fresher ones, if you take it into a perfectly darkened room and let your eyes um, adjust, the gills will give a bioluminescence. And there's some other mushrooms that actually give off uh, bioluminescence to various degrees. The purpose of that is not exactly known. It's thought maybe, you know, that little light that it gives off might attract insects who help to disperse the spores. Um, because again, um, it's a spore bearing body and it's looking for every advantage to try to get its spores dispersed. Um, also of note, um, there's, there's a term called foxfire that we have um, that's particularly up here in the upper Midwest. And after a, um, after a fall rain, you may 
if you take a walk in the woods in the dark or on a, on a somewhat moonlit, moonlit night where you can trust and the ground is moist, if you step on certain uh, honey mushroom mycelium, sometimes it will give off a bluish green glow. There's also several other mushrooms that um, once in a while you'll see stumps that will actually have a glow to them. Um, there's, um, in fact, one of our members actually puts together a fungal nightlight um, that you may see a few of those available in the, uh, in the online auction um, that uses the mycelium of a particular mushroom, a stypticus mushroom. Or a uh, split gill mushroom, I mean. Okay, let's see if I can move on here. Okay, got the other way. There we go. Okay, so how do you go about identifying a mushroom? Well, basically, you just notice things, all right? First of all, you have to be, of course, you're going to be aware of what season you're in. Because different mushrooms tend to fruit in different seasons of the year. Um, um, you know, so in springtime is typically when you find morels. You're not going to find them any other time of year in the state of Minnesota. Um, the summertime is when you tend to find chanterelles and porcini. In the fall is when you find, you know, hand of the woods um, and honey mushrooms. Uh, winter time is actually there's some mushrooms you can find, but those tend to be the ones that are very persistent. The, the many of the wood rotters that actually persist and are very very woody themselves tend to hang on the trees, and you can still find them. Uh, they're not, you know, used for much of anything except for possibly making herbal teas and that kind of stuff. Uh, the habitat that they're in is very very important because. You know, some tend to grow in yards. Um, one of the presentations that we're going to have possibly in August, we'll talk about, I see it growing in my yard. What is it? Uh, and it's a presentation that talks about um, many of the yard or lawn mushrooms that tend to come up. You'll, some mus mushrooms tend to grow up in meadows. But again, these are not nearly as prevalent as the ones that tend to grow on the, in the woods. Um, and the ones that grow in the woods will either grow on the ground or on wood, um, wood pieces or actually on uh, down stumps, down logs, that kind of stuff. So they can grow on any, any of those particular substrates. But um, most of the ones we tend to run into um, are growing on dead organic matter or in conjunction with a plant as a, as a symbiont or they're trying to kill whatever it is that they're, um, that they're associated with. There's actually some evidence, and I'm going to throw that out here. There's some, um, at least um, what I'm noticing is around the clusters of large buckthorn, uh, there's a lot of honey mushrooms that tend to grow around the base of those. And that would be a good sign that maybe honey mushrooms actually can do some good things for us in um, getting rid of some of the larger buckthorn um, that tend to really make the woods a, a very difficult place to walk here some, at times in Minnesota. Um, other things you need to notice, overall appearance. Do they grow singly in groups and clusters? What's the color, the shape, the size, the smell? Um, how are they attached to the, uh, to the substrate? And then also um, caps, gills, stems, um, all of those things is, the, you know, what color is the cap? Is it, is it sticky like on a honey mushroom? Um, do they have a cap? Maybe some don't, you know, they have different structures. Do they have gills? Are they do not have gills? If they don't have gills, do they have teeth, pores? What are the colors of the gills? Do they descend the stem? Are they attached, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we will show you some um, further information about that here shortly. In fact, in the new members packets that you're sent, when you join, um, we share a great deal of information that's attached there. Hopefully, you've taken the time to uh, look at it. And if, if not, go back to what was attached and um, check the download and see, because there's a number of pages of information 
that you can use, especially this time of year when you can't be out really looking for very many mushrooms, you can do your study. This is a good time to actually study. Uh, the stems, whether there's actually a stem and, and various aspects of them. So the bottom line is how much you can actually physically notice, just like you're noticing any kind of thing or organism that you're out in the woods to notice. If you, you know, if you hear a bird in the tree, you're trying to look for it and see it and what color it is and how high, et cetera. So it's not much different when you're looking for mushrooms. The good news is mushrooms don't move. So you got plenty of time to actually notice things about them to even take pictures and a number of other things. Um, but also know that, you know, they will continue to work toward maturity to drop their spores and then eventually rot away because that's what they end up doing. So your time frames may be kind of limited. So here's, here's one of the um, items that we have included in that uh, newcomers packet when you, your welcome letter, when it comes to you. So these are the study sheets that we're talking about. So we've included some study sheets in that welcome packet that, you know, kind of uh, fills you in on some of those things when you're using your observation skills. What should you look for? You know, what shape is that cap? You know, um, is it rounded? Is it, it has a point? Does it go in? Does it come down? Does it have gills? Um, and we'll be talking more about um, how the mushrooms fall into different categories. Um, also in that newcomer's packet, there's information for if you're going out to the woods for a walk and looking for mushrooms on a foray, you know, what should you bring? How to prepare to do that? Information on the society itself. Also information on um, things like, um, I'm gonna have to go back here. Um, background information society. And then information on uh, guidelines for collecting mushrooms as well. So those are all some of the things that are in that packet that we have sent you. Okay. So we know that the mushrooms fall into basic groups. And this is really important because when we go on on our forays and you're collecting mushrooms, we want you to bring them back to the table and we want you to put them in a, a, a container that we have there and be able to put them out on the table in the right area, okay? And this is also where you start to learn about where the mushrooms, how do I learn these mushrooms? Which category do they fall in? How can I look them up in a book, okay? So we have guild mushrooms and we're all familiar with guild mushrooms because we all go to a grocery store, we probably have purchased um, the white button mushroom, or the brown mushroom, they're all the same mushroom. Um, Beleeds, tooth mushrooms, polypores, and others. So these are the five categories, gild, beleeds, tooth, polypores, and others. So we're gonna now take a, um, a, a trip through looking at some pictures of each of these categories. Okay, so the parts of gild mushroom. There's this cap. Again, we had, there's a variety of different types of caps. Does the um, mushroom have a stem? Okay. Does it have a ring? Where is the spores dispersal again? From the gills. Okay. And the mycelium is under the ground. Oh yeah. It doesn't come out of an egg or a vulva. Okay. Those are all observations that you can make of the gilled mushroom. Some do and some do not. Yeah. Okay. So here we can see the gills. They're quite distinguished. They come from the center of the stock and come up and they're quite wide. Um, these gills are running down the stem. These are ridges. They're on chanterelles, which fall under the gilled area. They also run down the stem. Yeah. And as we can see, there's a variety of colors of gilled mushrooms. Not all gilled mushrooms are edible. Not all gilled mushrooms are not edible. I mean, there's no one rule you can follow that is a catch-all. Okay. Here we can't see them, the gills, but if you get up underneath and pick one of them and look at it, then you'll be able to know if it has gills or not. Other times when you look at that mushroom, you can see it right through the cap. 
what are you noticing here? Okay, you see the ring? See the shape of the cap? Gosh, the stock, it looks can, almost furry. You can also see some of the mycelium at the bottom, bottom. at the base. Here's a gilled mushroom, the shaggy mane. It's a very good edible. Um, it's kind of interesting because we would always pick these when they're um, the smaller ones that they haven't um, started to mature. And um, we had an opportunity to um, actually be with Alan Burgo and he actually shared a soup with us that he made from the ink of shaggy manes. So then one of the other classes then, or one of the other groups that you can put mushrooms in, because whether you're, you know, with one of our forays or you're out by yourself and you're trying to figure out what kind of mushroom you find, uh, basically you need to put them in some kind of a category so that you can actually break it down into a smaller subgroup so that you can then go on from there. Um, so the next group that we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about the bolites or the tubed mushrooms, um, bolites, there are some, some mushrooms that are actually the genus boletus, but there's also some mushrooms that, that are so similar. They're all just thrown in the category of a group of mushrooms called bolites. And they all have this tube structure for all intents and purposes from the top. They look just like every other mushroom or gilled mushroom that you've ever seen out in the woods. Um, that would be grown from the ground or off of wood or whatever. But you'll notice underneath the cap, there is a structure called tubes that, um, that, that sets it apart. And these are all uh, mechanisms that um, nature has come up with to maximize spore dispersal. So that's uh, the primary purpose. Again, this is, a good picture that shows actually some of that tube structure it goes up into the cap a bit and actually the tube layer and the cap flesh can actually be separated on, on uh, bolete mushrooms on most of them. There's a few that are, are uh, will, will fight that, but uh, by and large you can separate those and it's really interesting. Uh, but you notice um, a slug has done a good job actually uh, nibbling on some of the tube layer in here and showing you a little bit further in there. Um, so the spores would actually disperse out of all of these individual tubes, dropping down onto the ground, being washed away, carried away, um, whatever. Um, so that's the primary mechanism. Uh, what is the difference between a tube and a polypore? I'll get to that in just a second. Um, there actually really isn't a lot of difference um, because um, a tube and a pore, a tube is actually a structure that continues up. A pore is just the opening. So um, if you just look at it as a simple as a simple thing as that, is the tubes is this whole long thing that goes up inside and the pores are these individual openings. So polypores have these individual openings in the outside, but you cannot separate the layer that they lead into from the actual flesh of that, of that polypore. So that's one of the differences. Oh, good question. Um, let me see if I can, uh, let's see if I can move on here. Yeah, there we go. All right, so you can see this again, this is another bolete species. Um, this is one of the red, uh, red poured or tubed uh, layer ones. And it also has kind of a reddish stem. So all of these are things that you would pay attention to when you're trying to do an identification further about these mushrooms. This is actually a, um, another one. And, and you notice one of the things that's most spectacular on these is you notice there's some staining that happens. Uh, when, you, when you first cut these mushrooms, it was white. But then almost instantly or very quickly, it turns this grayish blue or a, a grayish color. There's various staining or bruising that happens on beliefs many, many, uh, in many of the cases. And that's a further identifying feature that's very, very important to uh, take note of uh, because the books will actually list that 
Um, there's some rules of thumb you go by, you know, that if it has red tubes like this, caution, 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 you know, avoid them. But then again, we did a, a mushroom hunt in uh, Black Forest in Germany, and these are, they're looking for red poured mushrooms to eat, red tube mushrooms. Um, so, which is, but different places, and that's why it's very, very important that you play, pay attention to the area that you're in and you become familiar with the area that you're in. And uh, many of the names that we have been used to using in the past for our various mushrooms were European or Asian based. And we're finding out that we have significant differences that um, they're not the same mushroom. Um, for instance, uh, the Boletus edulis, the Porcini's, Ours, we don't really have edulis. We have a complex that are closely related, uh, but that's only one example. Um, so you have to take uh, great care because um, there are some mushrooms that are particularly dangerous that we find in Minnesota. And a similar mushroom in Asia may be a highly prized edible, um, but it's not the same mushroom at all. In fact, we've worked with the um, Poison control. The poison control. And actually, we worked with the extension service at the University of Minnesota to come up with a pamphlet to help serve uh, some of the Asian community who was um, inadvertently poisoning themselves by going to Phelan Park and picking destroying angels, thinking that they had paddy straw mushrooms because of the similarities. Um, you know, so you need to keep yourself um, up on the mushrooms of a particular area. So if you go to visit some other part of the country or another country, um, go with somebody who knows what they're doing or at least do some, uh, do some homework to make sure that you're not going to be getting yourself in some difficulty because of that. Um, some of the bolites are, in fact, many of the bolites are very striking, just beautiful. This boletus bicolor is just striking. And it actually is a pretty good tasty edible but there's three or four versions that are very similar to it. So you have to take care to make sure you know exactly what you got. And then again, I, I talked about this staining that occurs. I mean, you just run a knife blade across the uh, tube layer and find out whether um, it, it bruises. If it doesn't, that's an identifying feature. If it does, that's an identifying feature. Sometimes it's actually the flesh of the cap that'll bruise or the stem that bruises and not the whole thing or not just the tube layer. So, um, you know, read your books, don't take any shortcuts. There really aren't any shortcuts that you should be able to take when you're doing a mushroom identification, especially a mushroom that you're seeing for the very, very first time. And even the one that you're very familiar with, make sure you identify each and every mushroom before you even consider eating, eating it. Because all it takes in some cases is one wrong identification of a mushroom. And that mushrooms are not necessarily um, ones that will, well, you know, if that's a good edible mushroom, there won't be any bad ones growing near them. That's not true. I have found, I have found deadly amanitas right next to honey mushrooms, right next to hen of the woods on the same tree um, in Northeast Iowa on one occasion. So, I mean, they, they do occur close by. I have also, uh, on one of the forays that we go to frequently in early October, you can see sulfur tuft, which is one that will make you sick, growing right in and amongst the honey mushrooms. And, and knowing which one you got is really, really difficult. So you almost need to do spore prints and that kind of stuff. More on that in just a second. So beliefs, again, can be very striking. I mean, some really phenomenal looking things and variations that you find. And then you get to another class of mushrooms. It's actually a really, really small group. This is, this is a hedgehog mushroom, which is actually a prized edible uh, that we find really frequently here in Minnesota in the upper Midwest. And they have actually this structure underneath that looks really shaggy. Those are called dentums or teeth. So it's a toothed mushroom. And one of the other very, very prized edible mushrooms that's widely cultivated is, is the hericium mushrooms. These are reportedly also very, very good for cognitive function and a number of other things, but they just taste really darn good. 
Um, they taste a lot like crab meat. Uh, one of the features of them is you have to be extremely, extremely careful when you pick one to make sure that you keep them extremely clean. Because imagine trying to pick dirt, sand, and, and debris out of this very, very fragile looking structure, because in some ways it is a little fragile. So you want to keep it as possible, as clean as possible. And that that's true of any time you're out mushroom hunting. The more dirt you keep out of your basket, the better off you're going to be. Hi, John. Uh, there's Hi. another question in the chat from Hannah. Yeah. Would you ever eat an identified edible mushroom that was growing so close to something you've ID'd as poisonous? That's a great question. Um, by and large, no. Um, I, I, I tend to be a little concerned about, um, about the spores from that poisonous mushroom. Um, because if the spores from that poisonous mushroom get on it, and I, I don't have any scientific evidence about that, um, that the spores actually carried the, carry the toxins as well. I suspect they probably do. So I would be somewhat concerned. Um, that would be something I'd be, I'd be concerned about. Do you have any comment, Claudia? Um, I'm in the same boat. Um, I even, um, uh, one time we had people with us out on a foray and we had talked about what are chanterelles and what is a jack-o'-lantern and showed them pictures of it and everything. And, um, we went out and came back and I was checking baskets and seven out of the 10 people had picked jack-o'-lanterns in with their chanterelles. And, um, you know, I'm just really careful. Um, I try to make sure that if I do pick something, I don't know what it is. I use a little waxy and I put it separate. I keep it out of my edible basket and I put it separate. Um, so I, I wouldn't eat. Um, There's too many other mushrooms. I mean, you know, you'd have to be pretty desperate. I can't imagine you would. I, I, I just would avoid it. However, you know, if you wash them really, really well, yeah. you're going to wash the spores off and that kind of stuff. But still, I, it, yeah. it's your tempting fate. I, I just wouldn't do that. Um, good question. Um, here's one of the other toothed mushrooms. This is this is the one in particular that's not edible. It supposedly it's it's it uh, it's extremely extremely bitter and it smells like bad ham. So if you can imagine that. It's fairly common. You see it growing on old maple trees in particular. This is a, actually a maple tree that's really done. Um, it's pretty much dead. Um, so those of you who tap maple trees may be more familiar with this mushroom than some of the other ones um, because you see it. Uh, it's really distinctive looking and the teeth are extremely small, but if you look closely, you see the teeth um, underneath its structure. Sometimes, I can't imagine how, but some people will mistake this for other things that they think are edible. But you, again, pay attention to each and every aspect of a mushroom when you're trying to do an identification. Pay attention to all things. Look for those teeth, because if it's got teeth, it's not a polypore. So it can't be a chicken in the woods or a hen in the woods or, you know, any of those other things that you're looking for. So if it's got gills, it can't be a bleed. If it's got tubes, it can't be a gilled mushroom. I mean, there's, you know, there's certain things that really make things very mutually exclusive. So you have to pay attention to all those things. It's extremely important. Okay. All right. So it brings us into... Uh, the next category are polypores, and, and there was a good question about polypores, and I'm going to talk about that really quickly. This is this is called the pheasant back or the dryad saddle. It's very familiar, especially to uh, morel hunters in the springtime, because oftentimes it'll grow on dead elm trees that really have almost no bark left on them, and usually that tree is too far gone to have morels near it anymore. So um, this is a this is a really nice, um, uh, a beautiful mushroom to take pictures of. Some people will actually eat it. And they say it tastes a little bit like watermelon rind, but you have to get a very, very young specimen to try to actually uh, do that. Some people have prepared it, um, a little bit older ones and stuff, um, by marinating a bunch of different ways. 
I did try it one time and I chewed it for a, a, literally a half an hour before I finally gave up. Um, it just, it was so chewy and I thought I had like a really nice young specimen and stuff. So it may not have been the mushrooms fault. It may have, may have been my fault and how I prepared it. But, uh, um, some people really, uh, are uh, like this mushroom or enjoy it to me. Watermelon rind isn't necessarily something I cherish, but there are people that will actually pickle it because pickled watermelon rind, I guess, is, is kind of a good thing. It's kind of a good snack. So. But this is where polypores get their name, is that one of the best things that I like about this dryad saddle or pheasant back is that it has some of the largest pores or tube openings or pore openings, I should say, of all the polypores. Many of the other polypores, the tube or the uh, pore openings are so tiny, you either need a magnifying glass or something else, or you just use blind blind faith that they're actually um indeed that's what they are um but these have very very large ones so you can look at each individual ones for that reason you can actually do a pretty good spore print on these guys too and uh it, it can be kind of striking uh so the 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 spore deposit on these guys would be a white um these, this is the hen of the woods and the maitake mushroom. Maitake means dancing mushroom because whoever finds it dances for joy. Um, the whole thing is, is really very edible except for all the dirt and sticks and all kinds of other things that will be growing in and amongst it because, <coughs> excuse me, it's attached to the ground near the base of an oak tree usually. And it looks like a coral habitat and critters treat it like a coral habitat. So there could be all kinds of things in and amongst it. Um, we have found anything from mice to um, a snake, uh, frogs, uh, centipedes. Um, so I recommend that when you bring one of these homes home, leave it out um, in the garage or on the porch and start to clean it out there. And when you do um, break it apart, at least whatever is in there can have a easy exit. So this is what the bottom of it tends to look like. <clears throat> and again, you can't really tell the pore surface. I mean, you can tell that it's white, um, but you can't really see the individual pores. So um, to answer that question before is you can't really separate the pore surface um, and the tubes that these lead to from the actual flesh of the mushroom. Um, so that's one of the main differences between uh, the bolites and polypores. Um, also, many of the other polypores are very, very woody, um, not extremely fleshy. I mean, the chicken, or the hen of the woods and the chicken of the woods are two of the, um, and the pheasant back are, are some of the exceptions. Most of them are really, really woody, like these artist conchs that are up, you know, up above this, um, this hen of the woods. And the artist conch gets its name from the fact that when it's young, you can etch a picture into it. And when that pore surface, or yeah, when that pore surface dries, you will have a picture saved in there that's actually uh, somewhat resistant to being messed up. Uh, you know, so it's something you could display. Um, Howard Goltz, our uh, photo contest person, did a just a striking one um for us for one of our state fair displays unfortunately it was a little bit older specimen so it's kind of more brown than uh than we'd like it to be but um you can really do some striking artwork in here um and do some drawing so that's where it gets its name artist conch and then this is the chicken of the woods um these are the sulfur shelf mushrooms uh they grow on um dead decaying stuff, but they're also one of the parasites. So they probably killed this tree in the first place. Uh, maybe didn't put up fruit bodies, but the mycelium was killing the tree. And then all of a sudden after the tree dies, the mycelium um, will put out fruit bodies saying, we need to move on to the next tree. And that's how they can do that. You notice that you can get some incredible fruiting um, out of, out of one uh, mycelium or one particular organism. And 
you know, a lot of it. So the difficulty sometimes is getting some of these highest ones if you're trying to, you know, carrying a stick. Uh, one of the things we always walk through the woods with a stick just to, uh, because there's a lot of ravines, a lot of ups and downs, a lot of deadfalls that you're walking across. But the stick will also help you reach some of those higher ones and actually knock that down if you're trying to harvest it. And then you have some of the some of the uh, polypores that are, this one's extremely bitter and a lot more um, tough than it looks. But it, this is one of the ones that's used for dye, or, or for dye making, uh, for dyeing wool and other cloths. Um, this is a dye maker's polypore. And this is the one of the turkey tail mushrooms. Um, there's several very closely related mushrooms that are called trametes. That's the genus. Um, this one uh, we believe to be the true turkey tail. But again, if you're looking for um, turkey tail mushrooms to use for treating a particular illness, by all means, uh, get the uh, medicinal or the uh, pharmaceutical grade ones that are available from a number of sources. Um, and we have, we have access to um, actually a list of some of the best sources that if you need to get those. Um, but uh, that's a turkey tail mushroom. You see where it gets its name. Uh, these will actually dull out terribly if it gets really, really dry. But if you get a, a nice fresh rain, they actually many times will reinvigorate and turn back to this bright color. And one of the things is if you're out in the woods and you're trying to do a photo and you find one of these that isn't particularly bright and vibrant, take your water bottle and put it on there and try to reinvigorate it. And oftentimes you'll get good results and uh, can get a little bit better picture. This is a thing called chaga. Now I'm putting it up here because um, in state parks in particular, you cannot gather this anymore because people have dug deep into the trees. It, it looks like a cinder growing on a birch tree. And it, while it's not actually a mushroom, it is a, it's, it's a sterile conch or a sterile, it's called a sclerotium. And it's sort of like the food storage warehouse for the mushroom that's growing underneath the bark of that birch tree. And some look at this as actually being a scab on the wound because you actually usually find it on a wound in the birch tree or a place where the birch tree has lost a limb or a branch. Uh, you can walk thousands of birch trees and never find one of these. And then you can all of a sudden, you know, like 10 of them in a row might have some of these on them. This is highly prized as, a, as an herbal tea. Um, you can't, obviously you can't eat this. It looks like a cinder. You, so you, you break it up and you can make an herbal tea out of it. It also has alcohol um, soluble components that are touted for their medicinal qualities. Uh, but basically in, in my book, it's primarily just a really nice um, herbal tea. I'll tell you right offhand, it doesn't prevent you from getting prostate cancer. Because I've drank like three cups of this a day for probably the past 10 years. And four years ago, I uh, was diagnosed with prostate cancer. So um, don't believe everything that you read necessarily about medicinal mushrooms. Um, it's, again, things are very individual. Um, so there's individual truths. Um, but I do put this up here. Um, if you have birch trees on your property um, or access to birch trees, it, again, it's something that you should, you could try. And it's not an edible mushroom by any means, but it's consumable and that you can make a herbal tea out of it or use it uh, for making a, 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 a tincture uh, involving alcohol. Oh, the last category, the category of other. All right. Morels. We have lots of pictures of morels. Okay, there's. Oh, just a few. Okay. Um, so there's, you know, the, there's probably, I think Todd Odmanson from La Crosse, a mycologist that had given us a talk a few years back had told us that there is at that time at least 29 varieties of morels and there's probably a lot more now and there's lots of um, discussion about what we should call this morel. Um, 
I think um, this is one of the <laughs> names that we are, that started taking because they recognize that they're not the same as the ones that are in Europe, which was Morcella Escalenta. So the first shot that they had was Escalantoide. Since then, it's become there's an Americana, Americana and three or four other different closely related ones, depending on what kind of tree that they grow by. So we're just using Escalantoides just right now out yeah. of convenience because I can't tell you exactly which kind this was. Um, but it's a common morel. Right. We know that. It's a common yellow morel. And it is our state, state fungus. Yeah. We are one of only a couple of states, states that Four. has a state mushroom. I think uh, Oregon has the Matsutake, I believe. And there may be a couple of others, but I know we have the morel. So. Okay, so we find them in the spring. Um, and under other, we have eyelash cup fungus. Now this looks like a gigantic picture, but these are tiny, tiny, tiny little orange dots that you're going to see on dead wood. So, um, but they, you see where they get their name, eyelash cup. Okay, we've got some coral mushrooms and they come in a variety of colors, not just white. I've seen yellow, blue, pink, coral, purple, brown. Yeah. Every color. Just about every color. In fact, these may actually not even be Romaria species. These may be a Tremella or something closely related, but it, coral mushrooms tend to be much more difficult to identify than uh, many people will casually give credit to. There we go, that brilliant color. Oh, so you didn't find. Well, yeah, but I think these are dead man's fingers. Oh, we I were looking for a picture a for a of club fungus yeah. and we came up with this. And again, so it's either club fungus or dead man's fingers, but dead man's fingers tends to grow on wood and they'll, they'll grow in closely associated groups, whereas these look like individual club fungus growing out of the ground. Um, they're Cladaria alphas pistillaris or something like that, but uh, these look like club fungus. Um, there is one of them that is an edible one, but by and large, they are not. They're very bitter, um, but they they can be pretty striking if you find a bunch of these in the fall. They grow on the ground again if they're the club fungus. Oh, and our bird's nest, which are very, 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 very tiny. So you really have to get up close to get this picture. <laughs> but what's really cool about them, and you see those little egg looking things on the inside there with like, you know, the moisture and everything. That's where actually the spores, spores are, are born. Yeah. And they get splashed out by the rain and that kind of stuff, and the spores get dispersed. Ah, and puffballs, little puffballs, big puffballs. As long as they're all the way white on the inside, they're edible. They're purple or brown. Nope, leave them alone. And again, we mentioned that this year was a fabulous year for our um, large puffballs. Um, we walked our grandkids around a little park and in a matter of two weeks, we, that little, around that little park, there was over 24 puffballs. Some people had come along and splashed them around, but we picked them. We talked earlier about the importance of doing a spore print. And you probably saw with some of the pictures that you can actually look at the mushroom and if it's um, a mature mushroom, maybe some of the mushrooms underneath that already have the spore print. But if you bring a mushroom home and you want to do a spore print, you know, get a piece of white paper or dark paper. Oops, Oops. sorry. Well, I was trying to get it. A lot of people like to use um, foil, okay? Um, you cut off the stem of the mature mushroom and you place it on the paper. Okay, John's playing the- Well, I'm trying to get rid of the bar on the bottom because okay. it's annoying. Me. Okay. It's um, you cover it with a jar or a bowl and you let it set for at least 30 minutes. And you just want that uh, covering to um, give, you know, stay on there because um, you don't want the spores to come out or be dispersed, okay, without having that covering on there. And then you go back later and take off this, the mushroom. And I like to do it to more than one 
I like to bring uh, several of the um, specimens home and do it because um, you just never know if the mushroom itself is if it's too mature, has a, has a spore has been dispersed. And if you wanna get a, a really good spore onto the paper, try several of the mushrooms, okay? And then you just observe the color that's on there and that will help you when you go to look it up in a book, okay? So we'll go to the next one. So you can see that there is um, a spore print that we've done. And um, again, it, it doesn't just have to be a gilled mushroom. It can be a variety of different types, polypores, beliefs, whatever, okay? Some are actually harder to get spore prints out of than yeah. others, but you know, the especially the beliefs and the gilled mushrooms by and large, um, and actually you can get some really neat art looking artwork out of the spore print. Sometimes nature uh, does that for you. As you can see here, we have um, a honey mushroom. And what is the spore print? Right, you're looking right at it. It's white, look at there. Many of the tops of the, the uh, mushroom underneath the one ahead of it is white. And just by looking at the gills doesn't necessarily tell you uh, what the color of the what the color of the spores are going to be because sometimes the gill color will change, and we'll actually show you a little bit of that as we get into this. All right, so let's get back to the the question, and we're going to be done here in just a few minutes. But the question is, can I eat it? All right, remember about fifty percent are inedible, twenty five percent are edible, but you you know just too gross, and again. 20% or so will make you sick. That's where the term toxic is. Um, could be gastric toxins or a number of other different types of things that will just make you feel real bad. Um, could give you human, human faucet syndrome or worse. Um, so, you know, those are ones that have to be very, very careful of. Um, and some of the more dangerous mushrooms we have in Minnesota actually fit in that toxic category because they're only dangerous in particular because they're so common and people will pick them and just eat them for without really knowing what they are. And then they'll get very, very sick and um, they recover, but still, you know, it's, it's just very unpleasant. And then we're talking about 4% or so that are good to eat and worthy of seeking. Um, one thing about edibility in particular is that we all, a lot of us have different food allergies. So there may be certain mushrooms that are touted as highly edible. Uh, there's a lot of people, for instance, can't eat morel mushrooms. Um, they just tend to make them sick. A lot of individuals have gotten sick from eating honey mushrooms, especially if they're not cooked far enough or enough. Um, supposedly, if you eat sulfur shelf mushrooms or the, those uh, bright yellow chicken of the woods, that are gathered off of certain uh, conifer trees um, that you can actually get sick from them. Um, and the difficulty in, in that particular case is because oftentimes they're growing on dead wood that you can't even identify necessarily what kind of deadfall that is. Uh, so it can make it very difficult. Um, but, um, you know, down, it depends on whatever the primary trees in the area are. And then we get down to that one last thing is the 1% that will kill you. And that's nothing to be messing around with. And actually mushroom toxins fit into eight to 10 categories by different names. Um, some of them are called things like amatoxin. And in particular case, amatoxin makes it sound like they're only found in amanitas or that all amanita mushrooms have amatoxin, which is not true. Um, they can be found in some Amanita mushrooms, and they can be found in actually some Lepiotas and some Gallerina mushrooms. And Amatoxin is probably, I would say, is probably the worst of the toxins in that it, uh, it doesn't act on you very quickly. Uh, it could take as much as 10 to 12 hours before you get an onset of symptoms, and that, that delay can often mean that you don't realize that it was the mushroom that actually poisoned you. You just start getting sick and you're not really sure why. They also will, um, they'll start 
working on your uh, your kidneys and liver and actually uh, starting to destroy them. But in the meantime, you actually might start feeling better and thinking you're okay. And then suddenly you start going into a uh, hepatic shock or, or some other, um, some other thing. So mushroom toxins are nothing to be, um, you know, taken lightly. So by any means. Now I wanted to I, get, yes, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, yeah. There are a couple of questions from the chat. Do you want to? Sure. Okay. So Betsy Schultz gotcha. wants to know, does a very dry year hurt the spores? Will they be back the following year or how long can the spores stay dormant? Gotcha. And then Jim Mars wants to know, um, yes. or is asking, can you talk about the need to cook all mushrooms before consuming? Yes, oh. I will certainly do that. Okay. So we're getting down to the last things. I'm going to show you some very closely related mushrooms and I'm going to answer those questions right now, actually. Um, the spores they can persist really for an awful long time. And what you're more concerned about in a dry condition is whether the mycelium will continue to thrive. Um, and mycelium is pretty tough. Um, if the plants that they're host with or that they're on or not host with, um, if the plants are surviving, uh, the mycelium probably will. And you may see uh, you may see them coming back when you do get um, when you do get adequate rains and moisture. But many mushrooms actually are fruiting because of their food source dwindling. So you're going to see gigantic fruitings of morels, for instance, because that elm tree has died. The mycelium of the elm tree, or the mycelium of the mushroom, has probably been growing in in relationship in a symbiotic relationship with those elm trees the whole time the elm tree's been healthy and then all of a sudden the elm tree dies and the mycelium realizes its food source is being threatened so up it pops all these fruit and starts shooting its spores so that it can move on to the next suitable habitat for it to continue its life and there's a lot of mushrooms that actually respond to actually a, a situation where uh, their food food source is threatened. Um, so that's where the fruit bodies actually come up. But because again, the mushrooms themselves are that fruit body um, to uh, propagate the mushroom um, or to prop propagate the organism. Um, as far as cooking mushrooms, yes, all wild mushrooms should be cooked. In fact, even the store-bought mushrooms by and large, they would be much more digestible for you or for all people, if you were to cook them first. I will talk about, my wife re briefly touched on the criminy mushrooms and the white buttons and the brown buttons and the portobellos and all that stuff in the grocery store. They're all exactly the same mushroom, just different growth stages of exactly the same mushroom. Or some mushrooms are grown in the, grown in the dark, which is the white ones. Some are grown in light, which is the browner ones. And so they're all... Um, the same species. genus and species, um, just different growth stages. But um, because mushrooms are made out of chitin, chitin is something that we don't digest particularly well. So by breaking down that chitin structure a little bit by the cooking process, and really a lot of different mushrooms, um, that's why I highlighted the term toxins when I talked about some mushrooms are actually poisonous. Many things are called toxins in our bodies. Uh, or, I mean, basically the term toxin more refers to things that are outside of our normal chemical makeup that may cause us some kind of problems um, if we don't either cook or whatever. There's a lot of plants that have various toxins in them in minute amounts and the cooking process actually makes them okay. Um, true of mushrooms also, uh, <clears throat> but there are some mushroom poisons, no matter how much cooking you do, amatoxin, you can't cook it away. Um, but at any rate, you should always cook mushrooms. Uh, you should always cook wild mushrooms. And then there's some practical reasons besides, because as you're cleaning them and preparing them and cooking them, you're actually cleaning away some of the other uh, debris and things like that, that could be, uh, could be problematic for you. Um, and you know, a lot of times 
mushrooms are growing near the base of trees and stuff and you've got dogs and foxes and wolves and other things that like to use trees as urinals and you know your mushrooms are right down there you know so you want to make sure you clean them you want to cook them all that kind of stuff so how many people are leaving the club right now because there's <laughs> i ain't eating that stuff anymore so okay. um but at any rate um uh, so you should always cook your mushrooms to break down the chitin structure to make them more digestible for you whether it's actually the mushrooms on the salad bar yeah they don't have that strong of a structure but you still should always cook them all right so this is a chanterelle mushroom <clears throat> this is um one of our prized edible mushrooms it sort of looks like it's growing in a cluster but that's only sort of a coincidence it's actually growing out of the ground they're by and large uh individual ones it just so happens to be this is a really happy mycelium so it's popping up a bunch of them really close together but that being said this looks really similar now it's got a little oranger color and a little dirtier looking but maybe the mud just dropped on it but this is actually a cluster of jack-o-lantern mushrooms which will make you sick and these are probably growing in fact they must be growing actually off of some buried wood so so you, you can't just base it on color you have to base it on a number of things you can sort of see the the ridges that are coming down the stem of some of these these ones will have true gills their flesh will be a different color when you cut them um and actually Part of the problem with jack-o'-lanterns in particular is when you get really, really young ones like this, um, but you can obviously see they're growing near wood and they're growing in a cluster, but the gills don't look very far uh, developed, so they may be taken as ridges, but if you cut these things, the flesh is going to be orange instead of, instead of white or real, real pale yellow. And again, these guys will make you sick. So jack-o'-lanterns are ones you have to worry about, but they're fairly easy to stay away from because they grow in association with either buried wood or dead wood, um, actually on trees. So they're in, in wood, not growing on the ground. And a big cluster of jack-o'-lanterns is relatively easy to actually identify. Um, but once in a while, somebody will come across this and say, wow, look at that cluster of chanterelles. And there's no way, um, you know, because, I mean, the gills will be very well developed. Um, the problem is they both have kind of white colored spore deposits. So that's difficult. Here's the shaggy mane mushroom. My wife mentioned this. Um, this is a really common mushroom that people find in yards and things. Um, yards can be problematic depending on what kind of chemicals people will use on their yard. Um, so, um, so that's a concern. But if you know the area is, you know, Chemical relatively tree. free of chemicals, that kind of stuff, this is a good edible mushroom. Um, but the problem is that looks really similar. Um, it's not nearly as elongated, but see a button of these guys sometimes isn't very elongated either. And you find these, these are actually green spored lapiota. And this causes more poisonings than any other mushroom in Minnesota uh, because people will mistake them for something like this. And then this is a parasol mushroom, which is not very common here in Minnesota. However, it's a good quality edible. But once again, it looks sort of similar to these guys. And these are really common. This is a little bit more, more to further developed green sport lepiata. And these will grow in fairy rings in yards and stuff. And there's some years that, you know, during the state fair time, people will be coming out of the woodwork saying, wow, look at all these mushrooms I got. You know, I mean, these look really, really good. And you say, no, you have to be careful. There, there's, a, there's a fairy ring, for instance, of a whole bunch of these guys. And they will make you sicker than you can even imagine. And this is why, where it gets its name, Green Sport Lepiota is that if you let it mature far enough, you'll get a greenish tint to the gills and the spore deposit on these guys will be a pale green. Well, there's kind of a weird green color. Um, if it was actually a parasol mushroom, it'd have a white spore print. And in the case of shaggy manes, 
they have a black spore print. That's actually because they turned to they turned to a liquid, a black liquid. This is the honey mushroom, and um, you already saw the spore deposit on that, but tend to be a white. Um, these are these are cortinarius mushrooms. Look kind of similar in a lot of different ways, uh, but these tend to grow. These grow on the ground. These grow. They can grow on the ground, but they can also grow in association with wood. But again, the spore deposit on these guys would be rusty color. This is another one. This is actually this is the wild version of the enoki mushroom that you can buy in the grocery store that looks like white nails, you know. But this is the this is the wild version of them. Um, they're a good quality edible. Um, but this is the deadly gallerina and they look sort of similar and they grow in clusters on wood. And this, this guy has amatoxin in it. This is that bad, bad toxin that grows in these guys. So it's not worth picking something like this. Usually they have a little bit of a ring around them. This one doesn't, the ones here don't really show much of a ring, but you can see they're growing on wood. But again, these guys grow on wood too. So there's a lot of caution you need to take when you're out there. And then you've got this whole family of mushrooms. This is a, this Amanita, this is probably not a Verosa. This is probably a Bisporigera, but it uh, could be a Verosa, but um, they're also called de destroying angels. And this has got the bad amatoxin. This is the one that the people um, would pick in Phelan Park because they grow around oak trees and other, other hardwood trees. And they're actually a sign of a very healthy tree but they will, they will, they could potentially kill you. Uh, this is some of the other amanitas. Um, this doesn't have amatoxin in it, but it's called yellow patches. Really, really cool. And a lot of the, a lot of the amanita mushrooms come from this little bulby base at the bottom. They can look very cute, very pretty. Um, there's a lot of variation. We have a lot of amanitas that we find in Minnesota. By and large, and this is actually a destroying angel egg um, that has started to pop up. Um, so this one is deadly and dangerous. Some of the other ones are will can make you sick. There's other toxins that are in them. Uh, this particular one, I'd have to ID it for for 100 certain, but it may be the one that isn't deadly, or I mean, is it one that's going to make you sick? But I, I can't eat an amanita uh, just because of that. And there's other parts of the cut of the world where amanitas are actually prized edibles. Um, and, you know, so you just have to be very, very careful. Again, locally pay attention, um, know what, you know, grows in your area, what grows in your habitats. Um, you have to do your homework. So there's, you don't just go out in the woods willy nilly and just start picking things and think you're gonna be okay. I'm gonna leave you with a actually a saying here. There are old mushroomers and there's bold mushroomers, but there are no old bold mushroomers. So you need to take care, make sure you know what you're, what you're picking and what uh, type of mushroom um, it actually is that you're taking at home. We used to say, you have to be 100% sure it's so difficult to be a hundred percent sure, but boy, you need to be in the high nineties um, or even more. Um, and I often explain it that if you go to the pharmacy and your pharmacist is only 90% correct, is that good enough? No. Uh, so you want to be very, very certain of what it is that you're actually eating. Um, mushrooms are good for you. There's a lot of nutrients and a lot of good edible, uh, or a lot of minerals and things that you can gain from them. Uh, they, it's, you know, so they're worth seeking. I'm gonna leave you with one last bit of information. Okay, so when we go, when we go on to a mushroom hunt, in fact, um, whenever we go on one of our forays, we encourage individuals to actually document some of what they find. In fact, the DNR is starting to request more and more of this information. So we will start, we're gonna start using these more frequently where you put down as much information as you possibly can whenever you find a particular mushroom, if you're gonna bring it back for identification. 
um, you know, where you found it. If you know anything about a genus or species wise or a common name, or you can at least put it into one of the categories that we just gave you. Uh, there's also slime molds or lichens that is added there. So you can put it in one of those categories. You know what date it is. You know where you are. So document that. You know about what the habitat looks like. You may not know exactly what kind of trees are present, but you can ask somebody and they can sort of help you. Uh, you just do your best, best information at these particular things. And you try to document these and throw them in your bag with that particular mushroom so that it sort of gives whoever's there for your ID um, assistance, gives them some more information. We were at one of the forays uh, at, um, in, in uh, Isaiah County this past fall, and we found a very, very unique mushroom. I'm pretty sure that this is one that has never been documented in Minnesota before. And had we actually taken some more of this information and not had to try to do it afterwards, it would have been much easier for us to uh, turn it in. Um, as it as it turns out, you know, it may get documented within the Bell Museum. It may get identified and actually shown uh, to be present here in Minnesota when it never had shown before. Um, and how important is that? Well, that's how you can um, continue to to add to the database of knowledge. And knowledge is is extremely important, especially in an area of fungus fungus where we really don't have a lot of uh, a lot of knowledge considering the wide numbers that are actually out there so there you go uh, and that's pretty much that's the primary amount of of, of slides we had to share and sorry you know for uh, thank you for bearing with us on going through that many uh, there's so much information and we didn't want to take too much for granted so we will uh um, we'll look a little bit more on the chat and see if we can answer questions. We'll hang around for another 10, 15 minutes um, to answer any other questions that people might have individually if you want to do it with the chat or if you want to uh, unmute and actually talk. Uh, so we'll, we'll hang in here until 9.10 uh, to answer questions. But um, I'm going to look at the chat real quick. So anybody want to unmute and actually ask anything you uh, Hey, John, uh, yes. there was a comment um, further up in the chat, but do you want to talk a little bit about um, mushrooms and eating edible mushrooms and alcohol? Um? Yes. Okay, sure. Uh, there are there are certain edible, quote, edible mushrooms that are related to those shaggy manes that I showed you that um, have some evidence that you have to be extremely careful in consuming alcohol with them and there's probably some other mushrooms as well and that's before the consumption of the mushroom and after the consumption of the mushroom within a couple of weeks um, there's actually a substance in that those particular mushrooms that's similar to the chemical ad abuse that they use for treating alcoholism that as soon as alcohol hits your lips it makes you sick as a dog um, so those are, those are some of the, uh, some of the inky caps that are related to the shaggy manes, but the shaggy manes do not have that feature. Um, there's some of the other inky caps that are really frequently come out after rainfalls that grow really close to stumps. And one of them's actually called an alcohol inky. There's mica caps and a couple of others, uh, um, that are very closely related to the um, shaggy manes. But again, the documentation will tell you that. Um, so again, it's very important for you to have uh, some good guidebooks, not just one, get several. Um, look at several guidebooks and make sure. And then there's possibly some other mushrooms that may have that same type of thing. Um, there's also some, some insect-borne illnesses that, um, you know, we, we don't want to gloss them over by any means because actually um, here in, in the upper Midwest, we have a lot of ticks, we have a lot of mosquitoes, and there's, um, you know, you need to make sure that you wear your, um, 
you wear your tick, uh, anti-tick sprays, you wear your um, mosquito repellents, you either spray your clothes, uh, do whatever you can to uh, keep them away. Uh, because many of those diseases are actually um, every bit as dangerous as eating the wrong mushroom. So it's asking what are candy caps? Candy caps are a mushroom actually that's found very there. It's a lactarious mushroom that's found on the West coast. And they have, they have the chemical in them that smells every bit like maple syrup. And you can make phenomenal desserts out of them. Um, we have a couple of other lactarious mushrooms in the upper Midwest that smell like maple syrup as well, but there's no evidence that they taste particularly good. And I can't find anything that says I should try to eat one. So the ones that I collected this past year, I am not going to. Um, so the, the candy caps, it's lactarious. I do not, I don't know off the tip of my tongue what the scientific name is, but if you do a Google search on candy cap mushrooms, it will come up with two or three that are actually listed. Um, that will, it will come up with a couple of names, but again, they're found primarily on the West coast and uh, they're a small lactarious mushroom. Thanks, so, John. All right. Any other questions? Well, I want to thank you all for taking the time coming. So um, you guys take care. And again, any questions, never feel, never Wait, there feel. There was one more. Okay. Yeah. Um, Hannah says when foraging for mushrooms, I tend to have a hard time actually finding very many, despite having done many hunts in different locations. This is more procedural, but do you have any recommendations for the process of finding them? Like, should you try to cover a lot of ground or look more closely into smaller areas? Well, my biggest, my biggest concern is that many people will go too far into the woods thinking that the best mushrooms are going to be way in there. And then on their way back to the car, they usually end up finding more mushrooms within like 50 yards of their car. Um, so a lot of times uh, look toward the edges and, um, you know, so that's one of the things, but it doesn't hurt to just find somebody who kind of has, you know, knows a little bit about looking for mushrooms because most of it, it's, it boils down to there's certain tree types that are go-to areas. So if you know what an oak tree looks like, if you look around oak trees during the right times of the year, you're going to find some mushrooms this unless there's no rain. Yeah, I was gonna say the weather might have been this past summer yeah. was you gotta have rain. So if you're walking around a woods that's primarily maple woods, you're not gonna find nearly as many mushrooms. Um herisium like maple trees, but again, that's late in the fall and it grows on the wood on the wounds out of the maple tree. But by and large, maple trees are not so good because they have a lot of mushrooms associated with them, but not ones that fruit. So this is a complicated thing, but um, you know, um, some of the pines are really, really good, but some of the conifers are really, really good, but some of the conifers are not good at all. You know, so again, knowing your tree types is, is really, really helpful. So, you know, make sure you know your trees, um, know what kind of areas, what kind of trees are growing in a particular area. So that will help you a great deal. And then if you go to an area where, if you go to a state park on the weekend, you're you're fighting an uphill battle because there's probably a lot of competition. Um, it can be true of another area that's really well known for mushrooms. So you're fighting competition. Um, a lot of people, when you trim a mushroom off the ground, there's people that are really, really adept at hiding where they have just picked a bunch of mushrooms. You know, so, um, you know, so that can play against you too. But generally the weather, you need to have a lot of rain for most kind of mushrooms and you need to have the right kind of trees and habitat. Yeah, even yep. one of our yep. So if you come along on a foray, that'll help you because we, the only thing we can guarantee on, a, on one of our forays is we will show you the right kind of places to look. We won't necessarily find 
what you're looking for, but we can show you the right kind of places to look that will help you in the, in the future. So, you know, it's like, you know, we could give you a fish or we could teach you to fish and which one's more effective. So we're going to do our best to try to teach you the right kind of places. That's what the purpose of our forays is, is for teaching, not for filling a basket. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so I saw that comment. Good. Any other comments or questions? Deal, you thank you very much for uh, for eyeballing that for me. I appreciate of course, it. I think just a lot of comments thanking you guys for a great oh, presentation. Well, it, it, Super. yeah, we hate talking to people. <laughs> <laughs> we hate sharing information. So, yeah. So, except I won't give you my secret morale spot. I have to learn it myself yet. Well, and one of the things that I think we would like to do more of this year is we'd like to take um, some new people out with their books and just find the mushroom and show them how to use that book and do a spore print out in the field or um, use your resources to get information. And, and of course, there's, there's a lot of apps now available to help too. There's a lot of information on the internet and most of it's good. I mean, there's some that's really dangerous, um, you know, so, you know, hopefully if we notice that, you know, we'll call them out on it. And we have actually been able to get a couple of dangerous um, posts taken down um, because, I mean, they were recommend, there were some people that were recommending eating morels raw and that kind of stuff. And, and that can be extremely, extremely dangerous. Yeah, there was like a whole cookbook that um, yeah. Yeah. was full of raw mushroom recipes where like you dipped a raw mushroom into chocolate and then that was the entire recipe and recommending that people eat that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some mushrooms that you can get away with eating raw. I mean, obviously, otherwise salad bars wouldn't have, you know, the little sliced buttons on there, but. You know, there's a there's a few others, but you know, generally the rule of thumb is you must cook a wild mushroom uh, before you eat it. And if if my little uh, tale about they grow close to the ground and urinals doesn't convince you that you should clean and cook mushrooms. Uh, so about three months, we should be out looking, right? Well, I sure <laughs> hope so. I sure. Well, I, I'd say four, okay. but yeah, so. Everybody, you know, happy hunting. Hopefully you're going to, you're going to find stuff. Um, so, and e even in August, I, we will say this, you know, when we we're talking about the moisture is very, very important. I mean, one of the last forays we had of the summer before, before September, anyhow, we did Lake Mariah and there had not been any rain and we were, you know, kicking ourselves. Should we do it? Should we not? Well, we found like, 40 different things, you know, and everybody went home with some chanterelles and lo and behold, while we we're out there, it actually rained on us for 20 minutes. <laughs> it was the first rain I'd seen in, in, you know, in three weeks. like three weeks, but you know, you never, right. Amelia, you never really, know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there was a few things, a few people along with us. So, you know, you know, don't necessarily talk yourself out of something either. Do, do your homework, but by and large, yeah, you need decent rains. I mean, there was, you know, August was kind of ridiculous when it comes right down to it, but the rain started coming about state fair time. I mean, the first four or five days of the state fair it rained and rained and rained. And then all of a sudden the puff balls just started going crazy. And, you know, I'm not a big fan of puff balls, but you know, like there you go. So, there you go. You, so thank you all for coming and uh, hopefully we'll, see we'll you see you, uh, see you in the woods somewhere. And if you have questions, by all means, never hesitate. <laughs>